Quiet down, quiet down. If you could, please take out the homework uh, from the other day. Uh, excuse me? Could you put the phone away, please? Why do I have to listen to you? Well, I'm your teacher and you need to listen. That's not really a good reason. We have more important things to do. Oh, like what? All right, I hoped I wouldn't have to resort to this, but um, God rules it! <coughs> That's what I thought. And now that I have your attention, God's plan part three, let's do it. I think most of us would be more likely to do something if we knew that it was God's will. If it's what God commanded or what God wanted us to do, we probably do it. And that's the basis for the Crusades. It's why everybody went. Everybody thought it was God's will. The truth is, you and I don't know what God's will. That's why it's His will and not ours. And oftentimes, His will is a lot different than what we want. People during the Middle Ages didn't really understand that. They had different ways of trying to figure out what God's will was, as we'll see today. The Crusades were a world-changing series of events. And because of that, we've got to take a whole video to unpack them individually. So in a historical timeline, we are specifically in the 10 hundreds or so. About the year 1000 all the way to 1200. Now the word crusade itself often evokes religious terms. It's considered to be a holy war or war fought over religion. And that's exactly what it was. It is one of the largest military conflicts between two religions. In this case, Christianity and Islam. The two religions that had clashed earlier in 732 at the Battle of Tours will come together once again in a number of different battles. But to understand why the Crusades go down, we need to understand what else is happening at this time. Some of these things we've covered, but let's review. At this time, the most simple way to put it is Europe is a mess. You've got feudalism that's divided up the continent. You've got the wars between England, France, and the Holy Roman Empire for feudal lands. And above it all, you have a church that has supreme and total power over every single person. Because of the power and authority declared by the Pope, as well as the fact that the penitential cycle, this belief that you have to continually confess your sins and pay penance for them in order to get back to the state of grace, governs every aspect of life. And on an even bigger level, the church has other problems. Remember, in 1054, the Western Church, or the Catholic Church, and the Eastern Church, or the East Orthodox Church, split. And there were a ton of reasons for that, but just know they believe some very different things. This created a bigger divide between the kingdoms of the West and the Byzantine Empire. Even though they were all Christians, they were not getting along. And it's at this point that the Byzantine Empire is beginning to suffer and dwindle. By 1071, the Seljuk Turks, a nomadic group of horse people who had converted to Islam, had conquered most of the Middle East and taken valuable land away from the Byzantines. <laughs> Yep, you got that right. Another group of nomadic horse people are going to change history forever. The Seljuk Turks were a thorn in the side of the Byzantines. And as Constantinople itself was constantly attacked, the overall land of the Byzantine Empire was decreasing. So much so that the existence of the world's once greatest Christian empire was being threatened by Islam. Desperate to save his dwindling empire, Alexius I of Byzantium sent an urgent distress message to the Pope and to the kingdoms of the West. Now, based on what I've taught you so expertly about the Great Schism and about any high school relationship in general, you could say that this is a situation like the great Taylor Swift song. We are never, ever, ever getting back together. Like, ever. Right? Wrong. Yet for a number of reasons, Pope Urban II was intent on responding with aid. Council of Claremont in 1095, amongst a number of nobles, mostly German and French, Pope Urban II called for a crusade against the Muslims, specifically a holy war meant to not only protect Byzantium, but more importantly, to free the Holy Land and the city of Jerusalem from Muslim control. Come back, Eastern Church. I've changed, and I'll prove it to you by saving you. That's basically what we got going on here. We've got the exes trying to reconcile their differences and come back together. That's what Pope Urban thought could happen here, that by going back and conquering the Seljuk Turks, he could reunify the church together as one. A religious war against the Muslims would also result in the reconquest of the Holy Land. You see, the city of Jerusalem is so important to Christianity. It's where Christ died, and that's so fundamental to the Christian faith. And for hundreds of years now, it had been in the possession of not only non-Christians, but Muslims. And we already know these religions don't get along. So the fact that it was in the hands of the Muslims was alone an insult. This was also a chance 
for the Christian kingdoms to expand outside Europe. So there are a lot of underlying motives here, and they all come together at the Council of Claremont. Here's what Pope Urban actually said when he tried to convince all of these nobles to come together and go on this crusade. On this account, I, or rather the Lord, beseech you as Christ's heralds to publish this everywhere and to persuade all people of whatever rank, foot soldiers and knights, poor and rich, to carry aid promptly to those Christians and destroy that vile race from the lands of our friends. I say this to those who are present. It meant also for those who are absent. Moreover, Christ commands it. All who die by the way, whether by land or by sea, or in battle against the pagans, shall have immediate remission of sins. This I grant them through the power of God, with which I am invested. Pope Urban II. All right, guys, so here's why you should go on the crusade. Uh, number one, God wills it. Uh, number two, I will it, so therefore uh, God wills it. Uh, number three, I'll forgive all your sins. Wouldn't that be nice? And number four, by the way, uh, God wills it. Yep, this is where that God wills it part comes in. See, the Pope, who, again, supposedly spoke for God, said that it was his will to go to the homeland. And nothing brings people together like that, especially within the medieval church. Remember, the people of the medieval church had such a dedication to the church and to their faith because of that penitential cycle. So if they believed something was God's will, they would go do it. Following God's will, forgave your sins. Concepts such as love, charity, obligation, and tradition all helped to shape medieval attitudes towards devotion, but perhaps the most powerful conditioning influence was fear. Thomas Asbridge. This is why the battle cry of the Crusades will be the Latin phrase, Deus Volt, or God wills it. Or as I like to put it in modern day, God's plan. Except, except this probably wasn't actually God's plan. At least, if you have an understanding of what the Bible actually says, this would make no sense. But once again, it showcases the power the Pope had over people. If the Pope said it was God's will, the people thought it was. Just a year later, in 1096, combined forces, mostly of French and German Christians, traveled to Constantinople and then the Middle Holy Land in what was the First Crusade. The First Crusade was mostly successful thanks to the leadership of a French nobleman named Godfrey de Bouillon. Along with four other German and French nobles, specifically Baldwin and Raymond of Toulouse, the Christians successfully liberated Holy Land cities such as Antioch, Nicaea, and Edessa, and by 1099, sieged Jerusalem and successfully took it on behalf of the Christian army. The success of the First Crusade brought many historical and religious landmarks in the Holy Land back under control of Christianity. In fact, the Crusaders established several different kingdoms in the Holy Land, including a kingdom in Jerusalem itself, and one in Antioch, and one in Edessa. It's actually Edessa where the much more boring Second Crusade. The Second Crusade started in 1144 when Edessa was reconquered by the Seljuk Turks. The attempts of King Louis VII of France and Conrad III of Germany to retake Edessa actually ended up in the destruction of Edessa. So the Crusaders turned their attention to the city of Damascus, which despite being under Seljuk control had enjoyed peace with Jerusalem. This caused the territory of both the Christian kingdoms in Jerusalem and Edessa to shrink as well as the Byzantine territory. Now, in both crusades, Christians had massacred massive amounts of Muslims in the name of God. It was common in many of these executions that they would force the Muslims underwater to baptize them and then kill them so that, in theory, they would go straight to heaven. We know that's not how that works, and what a terrible look for the Christian church at this time. The Second Crusade also proved that Christian control of the Holy Land was tenuous at best, and there was resistance. And it's at this time that Muslims began rallying together under the leadership of a dynamic new leader in Egypt. As the Christian kingdom of Jerusalem attempted further expansion, a new leader emerged in Egypt. His name was Saladin, and he was a Sunni Muslim leader who united much of the Middle Eastern Muslims together under his rule. A brilliant strategist, and probably even better with propaganda, Saladin was able to unite all these different Muslim groups together and form one massive army to march on Jerusalem which was exactly what he did. Saladin lured the corrupt and over-aggressive King Guy of Jerusalem out into the desert, and at the Battle of Hattin in 1187, Saladin brutally defeated the Christians who were not properly prepared for the desert environment and did not have enough water, and also took Guy and a number of other Christian nobles prisoner. The fall of Jerusalem once again caused the Pope to call for yet another crusade, this time to take back the Holy Land again. And this time he mustered all of Europe's leading leaders together. When as the King's Crusade, the Third Crusade was led primarily by Richard I or Richard the Lionheart of England, as well as Philip II of France and Frederick Barbarossa of the Holy Roman Empire. 
But as we know, Frederick Barbarossa never really made it because he decided to take a swim and drown because, you know, he's a moron. Regardless, the union of Philip II and Richard the Lionheart shows a brief moment in history where England and France put aside their differences and came together to form a super team. You got two kings at the height of their power coming together to take back the Holy Land. It seems like this is going to be a slam dunk, but it's not because one of them wasn't exactly all in. Richard and Philip, however, succeeded in recapturing the port city of Acre. This victory prompted Philip II to leave and return back to France because he thought the Crusades were over. But Richard pushed forward and also reconquered the city of Jaffa and from there attempted to reconquer Jerusalem. What resulted was a bitter rivalry between Saladin and Richard, two of the best military minds of the Crusades. And they actually both really respected each other. There's a story that when Richard got sick, Saladin actually sent him some fruit and some ice to help cool him down. Regardless, the crusade itself was basically a stalemate, and by 1192, Richard and Saladin signed a peace treaty that reestablished the kingdom of Jerusalem, but left the city of Jerusalem itself in the hands of the Muslims. This seemed like a good compromise. The Muslims who had been in control for a long time would maintain control, but the treaty also allowed for Christian pilgrims to be able to travel freely throughout the city and still have access to their religious areas. But for the Western church, this still isn't enough. That's right, round four. Yep, Pope Guilty the Third. I mean, Pope Innocent the Third decides to call for another crusade, once again attempting to retake Jerusalem. Now, this fourth crusade mainly consisted of German and Italian individuals. And of course, you need a way to get over to the Holy Land, and the easiest route was by water. So the army of crusaders hired a group of Venetian merchants from Italy to ferry them across the Mediterranean Sea. Except they couldn't really cover the cost. So the leader of the merchants proposes a new idea. How about instead of paying us, you lead us to a rich city in the Byzantine Empire called Zara. We can take it over, loot it, and that will count as your debt. So the crusaders say, sure, we'll make a little pit stop along the way. Well, more came into this pit stop. You see, there's some drama going on in the Byzantine Empire, and usually these fleets would leave from Constantinople. The Crusaders find out that not everyone's exactly happy with the emperor at the time, Alexius III. One of them would be the prince, Alexius IV. Alexius says, hey, I'll help you out. I'll send some troops with you and help supply your journey and pay for it if you help me depose the emperor. Oh, and then we can reunite the Church of Rome and the Church of Constantinople, right? Well, along the way, Innocent III excommunicates the Crusaders for attacking the city of Zara. And the coup is successful, establishing Alexius in power. But turns out the people of Byzantium don't really like Alexius, and they assassinate him. The regime that took over didn't want to pay the bill. And that's where things get nuts. The Crusaders turned on the Byzantines in what is now known as the Sack of Constantinople, in which for three days the Crusaders pillaged numerous churches and places of wealth throughout Constantinople and killed many East Orthodox Christians. So let me get this straight. What was initially supposed to be a rescue mission of the Eastern Church in the Byzantine Empire resulted in the rescuers attacking and almost destroying Constantinople itself. Huh. If we go back to our dating analogy, yeah, you know what, let's not. It's safe to say the Crusades were pretty much a disaster, not to mention there's a weird question of morality here. How can we be sure this is God's will? Because it sure seems like the Pope is just making things up as he goes along. Most people would say the Christians were not justified in their actions, that they provoked this war by invading a relatively innocent area. But this wasn't a random attack. You have to go back in history and look at the history of these two groups. There was more of a reason here. Take a look. Christendom might quite reasonably have been alarmed if it had not been attacked. But as a matter of history, it had been attacked. The crusader would have been quite justified in suspecting the Muslim, even if the Muslim had merely been a new stranger. But as a matter of history, he was already an old enemy. The critic of the crusade talks as if it had sought out some inoffensive tribe or temple in the interior of Tibet, which was never discovered until it was invaded. They seem entirely to forget that long before the crusaders had dreamed of riding to Jerusalem, the Muslims had almost ridden into Paris. They seem to forget that if the crusaders nearly conquered Palestine, it was but a return upon the Muslims who had nearly conquered Europe. The crusade was the counterattack, the defensive army taking the offensive in its turn and driving back the enemy to his base. G.K. Chesterton. I am by no means defending the actions of the Christians in the crusades, but I'm just trying to look at both sides. 
Isn't this the same as when the Muslims invaded Spain and, and almost got all the way to Paris at the Battle of Tours? It seems almost exactly the same. Remember, Islam is a religion that spreads by violence and conquest. Again, not saying the Christians were right, but I think the Muslims are at fault here too. Now the question of whether or not this was a just war is one that can be debated for a long time. But there are some results and effects of the Crusades that we need to take note of because they're going to change the world. The Crusades had left the Islamic world even further fragmented than it was before, and this allowed different areas of Christians to rebel against their Muslim leaders. This specifically happened in Spain, which had been ruled by the Caliphate of Cordoba, or El Andalus. An almost 300-year period of fighting and unification efforts in what was known as the Reconquista eventually led to the unification of Spain in 1492, when King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of two Spanish kingdoms, Castile and Aragon, were married. If those two names and that year sound familiar, they should, and we'll unpack that in our next unit. Second, the established kingdoms in the Middle East and the Holy Land now created trade routes back to Europe that better connected the world and allowed Europe to gain new goods, such as the game of chess and yogurt and chocolate. Third, this is also a period of unprecedented monarch power. Kings are the most powerful they've ever been because it takes a lot of taxation and a lot of power individually to muster these large armies to fight these battles. And at the same time, that's the fourth change too. The church is dwindling in power. Now this was certainly the height of papal power. The Pope was able to convince all these people to go on this crusade and promise them forgiveness, something he can't actually do. But the Crusades are considered a failure. So there's going to be some questioning of the Pope and the Church and even of God. European experiences in the Middle East and beyond created a wired worldview as well as a desire to further expand the world around them. This triggered adventurers like Marco Polo to travel further east to Asia as we'll talk about later on. But finally on a more positive note the Crusades would lead to an academic revival back in Europe. Contact with the Muslim world had given Europeans access to the Muslim worldview as well as the way they did education. Not to mention the sack of Constantinople also brought back a number of old Greek and Roman texts that brought back this old style of education back to Europe. That's going to trigger a major event down the line. The Crusades certainly leave a legacy, and it's debated about what the origins of that legacy are and how we should evaluate them from our worldview. Like so much in world history, that's something you have to decide for yourself. Maybe the Christians were right in their attack of the Holy Land. Or maybe they were wrong. There's so many factors that are a part of that. But we can't deny the fact that the world has changed forever. Yes, it's another example of conflict between Christians and Muslims, something that will continue through history. It's also a warning about how misinterpreting the Bible and God's word often leads to trouble. Especially from a Pope's perspective, when you're claiming to speak on God and what you say clearly isn't what God says, obviously that's wrong. I think it's safe to say that the Crusades were not God's plan. You can yell, God wills it, all you want, but it's not part of it. No matter how bad you want it to be true, just putting God wills it in front of something doesn't make it God's will. What a powerful reminder of how God's will is not ours. We can never truly understand it or know what's coming. We don't have control. God does. And yet the church is going to continue to claim this authority and put Christians in some pretty awkward positions. But maybe it's this abuse of power from the Pope that will bring about change. But that's a story for another day. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.